Okay, this is Peter O'Rourke with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Um, this today's training session is on learning how to geocode for your public safety agency. Uh, many of you are familiar with MAPSIG Foundation and some of the things we do. Um, essentially, our goal and our vision you can read here, um, our mission and our vision you can read here, but really what we do as an organization is try to help state and local, uh, primarily public safety agencies, um, be better equipped and prepared to respond to uh, disasters, plan for disasters, mitigate disasters, um, all within the context, context of geospatial. Um, so we're here for you, we're here to benefit you, and if there's anything we can do to help make your job easier, uh, we will do our best to facilitate that. Uh, the purpose of today is to develop your knowledge, skills, and ability. Really, it's something that is a very fundamental um, uh, aspect of GIS, which is geocoding. Um, geocoding is um, really converting street ad addresses into spatial data. Um, it's really the foundation of the map, it's building the map, and, and, and at the end of the day, geocoding is uh, a part of almost every application within GIS, and, and certainly for public safety where locational information is so fundamentally important. Um, one of the, you know, really, some of the objectives today and these certainly aren't the only objectives, and, and we would love to hear what your objectives might be um, for, the, for why you took today's classes, but, um, or today's training, but uh, one of our objectives, or a couple of our objectives for you is to complete the geocoding process. Um, Milton Ospina is an expert in this particular field. He understands transportation data, he understands GIS, he understands public safety. He has a wealth of knowledge and experience, and he's going to really get you into the, the nitty-gritty of geocoding. Um, and, and we want you to convert street addresses and spatial data in a public safety scenario. So we want to do this in a context that's relevant to our public safety community. Um, and then, you know, we'll take you through the process of displaying that converted street address onto a map. Um, all of that really is meaning we, we want to give you some, some real basic knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, and, and we can build from there as an organization. So if you've taken today's session, you have problems, get in touch with us. We can try to help you give you a little more additional training. Um, we can put you in touch with folks like Milton and others who can give you some technical uh, assistance. But at the end of the day, we want you to walk away from today with a little bit more technical ability than you might have had previously. Um, Milton, we'll stick to the, the slides for now, and then we get into the actual ArcGIS Online. I can hand it over to you. Um, but do you want to um, talk to your slides here? Sure. Yeah, so thank, thanks, uh, Peter. So one of the things we'll focus today on, on doing geocoding in, in ArcGIS Online, but I wanted to make the point that the here map content that we will be using today in RGIS Online is also the here map content that you find throughout the entire ESRI platform. That is important to know because if you're doing a geocoding in RGIS Online and then you want to use some of that data using a stream map premium, you want to make sure that you're using the same base map so that the data lines up uh, properly. We are an S3 Platinum partner. Here is an S3 Platinum partner, so we provide a lot of the data for all their products, uh, including obviously RGIS Online, Streamer Premium. Some of you may be using Business Analysts Online for doing uh, demographic analysis. So you find our content all throughout the S3 platform. Next. So Streamer Premium, which we will not cover today, is probably the most popular ESRI data product, and ESRI ha uses the here map content to create a stream map premium bundles of data for all the regions of the world. So on the upper right, you see how uh, there is a stream map premium in North America, Latin America, Europe. Uh, ESRI will be releasing Middle East and Africa next month, and APAC uh, later this year. The here map content uh, that you find in stream map premium is very much the same content you find in RGIS online, so you find our street data, our points of interest, administrative boundaries, traffic patterns, trucks, which is, which is a product that includes all the legal and physical restrictions for anybody that has to do any type of fleet routing. And obviously the uh, geocoding locators built for stream up premium are built using the here uh, point addresses. Next. 
So RTS Online, which will, which will be the focus of our webinar today, again, had used as the same, a lot of the same here map content that you also find in the Stream Map Premium. Uh, some key differences, though, are the following. So in the Stream Map Premium, you had traffic patterns, which is his 15 minute interval historical information for every day of the year. Uh, and you also find real-time traffic as well as predicted traffic. So real-time traffic is what's happening on the roads today, and predicted traffic looks at what's going to be potentially happening on the roads within, within the next 12 hours. So if you are in the business of routing fleets or doing any type of uh, routing application that sh should take into account traffic data, both traffic and predicted traffic will be of interest to you. Uh, last summer at the ESRI user conference, ESRI also implemented the HIA pedestrian content. So it allows you to do routing instead of just being limited to length or time, you can also do it based on how far you can walk from one location to another. And also the geocoding locators are built using the here point addresses, and I'll explain a little bit later what point addresses are. Next. And the last slide here is basically one of the other products that uses the here map content is business analyst, the business analyst suite of products. Uh, we do not provide the demographic of the business data, but we do provide the geography the geographical information on top of which ESRI provides the business and demographic data. This may come in handy if you're doing, uh, you might be doing an analysis in which you want to identify some type of demographical business uh, profile around an address or a series of locations in your community. Um, and it's a really neat product. They both have a desktop and server version for business analysts and business analysts online, uh, which also uses the uh, here map content available through our GIS online. I believe that's the last slide, and uh, yep. we should probably move and now, forward. Um, no, yeah, well, um, what I will do is um, turn it over to you. This is just a little process here we'll go through. Um, And Milton, while we're doing this, um, you want to give a little bit of background on yourself? Absolutely. So, can you see my screen now? Um, not yet. Make sure you just push share my screen. Okay. It hasn't come up yet. You click the little uh, white and green ball. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Now I see it. Great. So thanks again. So my name is Milton Ospina, and uh, I work for here. Uh, and here is a is a Nokia company. We are formerly known as Naftec. Um, so probably many of you are familiar with that name. We've been in the mapping business for 30 years, um, and we focus primarily on building uh, map content um, for uh, GIS companies, automotive industries, uh, mobile devices, and we focus, we focus quite a bit on navigation. Uh, so we'll, we have a great wealth of knowledge on how to route, how to geocode, and how to navigate uh, folks from one location to another. As I mentioned earlier, we're, a, we're an ESRI Platinum partner, um, and we have had a relationship with ESRI for over 30 years. Uh, Jack Danjerman was reminding us a couple of weeks ago uh, that was about 30 years ago that we first licensed our Kingfo to start building our maps. Um, so it's a 30 years relationship, but we have been an ESRI partner for the last 10 years, uh, providing map content for ESRI products. Uh, I've been in the mapping business since 1988. I spent 15 years working for ESRI, and I've been out here as a business developer manager for the last seven years. So uh, let me go ahead and get started with the, with the presentation. Uh, when you go to the NAPSIP website and you download the materials for today's session, uh, basically what you're going to get is a folder inside of which you find three additional folders. Uh, so you have a routing exercise folder, 
a uh, fire rescue station photos folder and a geocoding exercise folder, which is the folder that you will be using if you like to do this uh, webinar or this training on your own. If I open the geocoding exercise, you find three files. You have a .csv file that has addresses of um, Broward County, Florida fire rescue stations. Uh, you have another file that includes the sheriff office, district offices, and you find uh, the uh, tutorial for this webinar so that you can follow it uh, on your own. Uh, so let me open that document. I already have it open, uh, but it's a very detailed document. NAPSA did a great job on adding the KSA, which are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that will be supported in this webinar. They did a real nice overview on what knowledge you will gain and what skills you will develop. Uh, the, we have scenario, and the scenario that we will uh, go through today, which basically uh, the Broward County Sheriff's Department is interested in uh, putting on a map the location of all the district's offices and fire stations. Obviously, this is a critical information for any public safety application. We will focus on geocoding primarily, and late February we will do a follow-up webinar which will build on top of what we do today. But once you have geocoded locations, you can use the power of RGIS online to uh, analyze response type to 911 calls, uh, analyze uh, who, which station is getting the more volume of calls, which one is having to go out and take care of uh, public safety issues the most, which ones are being underserved and which ones are being overserved, and that type of analysis that any public safety organization should look into um, uh, every often to make sure that they're meeting their needs of the community. Uh, very detailed tutorial uh, with uh, lots of graphics, step-by-step -step instructions, tells you where to click and so on. So if for some reason you get a little bit lost today, you can always download this document and, and get going. Uh, it does require that you are a member of NAPSIC and then you have a login uh, for NAPSIC in order to uh, follow the, the webinar. So the first step in the, in the webinar is obviously uh, to sign in. I'm already at that location. This is what we refer to as the NAPSIC Center, and, and it's a very nice uh, customized uh, look and feel of RGIS Online. So if you have an RGIS Online subscription, you can do what NAPSIC did by creating this NAPSIC Center and being able to provide additional information. For example, uh, NAPSIC here added a uh, a box to, that allows you to link to the work that they have been doing with many of you probably on incident symbology guidelines, uh, information about the CARAT program, for example, or you may want to learn more about NAPSIC's education and training program or go to the NAPSIC website. So this is the NAPSIC Center. For today's purpose, I need to sign in. So I click on sign in. And obviously, NAPSIC will provide you with a login and password. And I'm going to sign in now. And when you sign in, you're still in the same location, but notice that I'm already signed in. I actually have a, a, a photo of myself attached to my profile. Uh, at the top here, you have a navigation bar. Uh, if you go to gallery, for example, you'll see gallery of maps uh, that uh, many members of the NAPSIC Foundation have created on their own, and you can navigate. And some of them will be, uh, obviously, if you're a NAPSIC member, you can open them and, and see what they were working on. Uh, there is also my content. My content will become a very, uh, a location that you will use quite a bit. Whenever you get lost in RGS online for whatever reason, you can always go to my map content and sort of uh, allow you to navigate uh, in, with an, uh, this, the RGS online subscription. Uh, for today's purpose, I'm going to go to the map tab. And by default, it shows me this particular map of 
of the United States. Uh, I'm going to change the base map. So what ESRI has done is that they have worked with many organizations to provide different base maps. Uh, you find the here map content primarily in the street space map. You also find some more content in a light gray canvas, dark gray canvas, and other products. For purposes of routing and geocoding, we will use the street uh, base map. Um, this is what it looks like. And once I'm here, I will be able to do routing and geocoding. Obviously, you can route and geocode for any of the, any of the base maps. So when you do the routing and the geocoding, you'll be uh, basically working against the here map content on our GIS online. Uh, the first step that we're going to do here is to geocode a single address. So right here, and then the find address or place uh, box, I'm going to type an address. Uh, notice that as I'm typing the address, some options come up, and some of these options are based on known addresses or places that I may have searched before. So I know this is the, um, the one that I'm looking for is this one right here, the one on Fort Lauderdale. So I'm going to click on that. And what RGIS Online will automatically do is uh, find that address and zoom to it. So this is what we call a single geocode or you may also call it a geosearch because you actually did not create a point at this point. So a single geocode uh, or geosearch for the purpose of what we're doing today uh, works. Uh, so one of the things that you notice here is that it gives you an option to get directions. We will not do that in the webinar today, but we will do, we'll work with get directions once you geocode an address uh, in the webinar next month. One of the things you want to do once you geocode or a single address, uh, it zooms in very closely. So you may want to zoom out a little bit to get a little bit more context. Uh, in public safety, it's all about situational awareness. So if you zoomed in too close, uh, you may not get a whole complete picture. So in this case, I just zoomed out a little bit to get a better sense of where I am located. So again, this is just a single address. Uh, a single geocode or a single geosearch, you probably will be working with numerous addresses. Um, and RGIS Online can easily handle what we call in the industry batch geocoding. Batch geocoding allows you to geocode from hundreds to thousands and thousands of addresses in a single process. Um, let me go back to this folder that I mentioned before. And I, I, I show you how there were two files that we'll be using today. What I'm going to do is open the first of those files. This is the Broward County Sheriff Office District. I'm sorry, Office District Offices. Um, it's very important when, do, when you build a file from which you're going to geocode, you follow certain rules. So in the United States, there are many different ways that you can geocode. For example, you may have experienced a situation where you go to a, a store and, and when you are at the cash register, they ask you for your zip code and you give the zip code. And what they're trying to do at that point is collect information so that they can do what is called uh, zip code uh, geocoding. And they don't really want to know where you live exactly, but they just want to have a sense of, uh, for that particular store, how far people are willing to travel from different zip codes to that particular store. That, that, that's, how, that's one type of geocoding. In our case, uh, we will be building, uh, you will be building more likely uh, an address file that includes an address field, this one right here, uh, one that includes the, the name of the city, the name of the state, and the zip code. So these are the basic fields that you need to construct when you're building your address file. RGIS Online recognizes that CSV file. So when you save your file, you want to give them the that CSV extension so they're comma delimited. So make sure that you are aware of that. I already had this particular file already saved in CSV format, so I'm ready to go. Notice that I have other information, like I had the district office name, and I have a, a non-emergency phone number. These are not necessarily used as part of the geocoding, but they'll be carried over into RGIS Online once you do your geocoding so that you can do further analysis with them. All right, 
So uh, let's go ahead and bring that file into our GIS online. So let me go to the geocoding exercise, and all you had to do is I'm going to uh, geocode the Broward County Sheriff Office Districts, and I'm literally going to click and drag onto the canvas of RGIS Online and let go. And you get what is called the Add CSV Layer dialog box. Uh, a number of things happen here. RGIS Online is, is smart enough to recognize that we're dealing with addresses, not latitude and longitude. But if you had, if your stat CSV file contains latitude and longitude or X and Y values, it will recognize that it will know how to geocode those. It recognizes that this is from the United States, but you may have information from another country and, and RGIS online may not recognize those addresses. It does give you an option to then pick the right country that you are geocoding against. The next set of fields here are very interesting. On the left side, you find the field names that we had on the .csv file. Let me just open that up for, so you can see that again. Those are the same field names. That's where they came from. And on the right side, RGIS Online is matching a field to another field. So uh, RGIS Online to Geocode needs an address field. It recognizes that the address field in my file is that field. It needs a city. It needs a state, it needs a zip code. This is important to know because when you are building your, your CSV file of addresses, you may want to follow the same rules and give them names that our GIS online will recognize easily. If you give them different names or, or whatever, then you have to manually uh, uh, link one to the other. All right, now that I had the right uh, link from, from the fields in my file to the links that RGIS Online is looking for geocoding, I'm going to add layer. And very quickly, RGIS Online literally found all of those. Let me try and close this for a second. Notice that um, there are, all the symbols are uh, small orange dots. So obviously, we can modify the size and the color of those, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, all right. So what have I done up to this point? Up to this point, I took the Broward County District Office uh, locations from my CSV file, and I geocoded those into RGIS Online. Notice that in the table of contents, now I see that file uh, as being available for me to do all that analysis. What I'd like to do next is also do the same process for the uh, Fire Rescue Offices. So I go to the Geocoding Exercise folder, same thing. Let me open that file. Looks similar to the other one. I have an address, I have a city, I have a state, and a zip field, and they're all filled in, which is nice. Um, I have the names of the fire rescue stations. I have their station number. I have phone numbers, et cetera. Those are things that I can bring along with my data. So. I'll follow the same process. I click and drag from that folder, and I drop it onto the RGIS Online uh, map canvas. Same process. I'm dealing with addresses I'm in the United States. Some of these fields are not needed for geocoding, but address, city, state, and zip code are used. Click Add Layer. And those fire rescue stations have been added. Notice that they're the same color, so it makes it very difficult to distinguish one for the, from the other. And notice that on the table of contents, I have two layers. So what exactly did just happen? So um, to do geocoding, there are a number of things that you need. Obviously, you need a, 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 a complete map, and that's where the here map content comes in, is a, is a complete map with three data. Every strict segment, segment has information about address ranges. Um, ESRI, you need a, a geocoding locator, and ESRI already built a geocoding locator using our here map content and the here point addresses. The geocoding locators are really a piece of software that includes definition and rules that tell the here map content, RGIS online, how to address match each address in this table 
to a physical location on the surface of the Earth, in this case, in Broward County, Florida. So that's geocoding. The geocoding locators are also very sophisticated because they're using point addressing. Point addressing is, is also known as um, content to do to the door geocoding. So you're probably familiar with address ranges. You can look at a, uh, every street segment goes from one to 99 on one side and to two to 100 on the, sec on the other side, on the opposite side of the street. Those are address ranges. And when you type an address like 2601 West Broward is looking at that location along that range. However, if you have point addresses, it means that here added a point in front of the uh, entrance to that location and that point is located on the street. That is very critical for a public safety application. So if you're dealing with um, mission critical situations like uh, there's been a, a, a crime at a specific location or somebody had a head attack and you need to get an ambulance to that, you wanna make sure that you're using point addresses to um, be more accurate in your geocode and you can get to that location and deal with the public safety issue in a much more fast and accurate uh, manner. So um, with RGI uh, Milton, online, go ahead. Uh, Milton, yeah, sorry to interrupt, it, Peter. Um, we have a question that's kind of a fundamental one I wanted. Uh, we have a bunch of questions, but one fundamental one I thought would be useful for you to address right now. Um, is there a limit to the number of records that can be imported um, onto the AGL canvas within a given CSV file? Uh, is it limited to CSVs or can shape files be imported the same way? Uh, no, that's a, that's a good question. So in this case, I'm using CSV because it's a very popular way to do it. You can certainly add shape files. So if you add shape files, of point data, those are already geocoded. So they will, they, and those files will automatically have uh, the um, latitude and longitude embedded in those in those point locations. So those will automatically geocode. And the CSV, I think last time I tried it, there's a limit. I think of 9.99 if you do the drag and drop, but I did, uh, and that may have changed in the last year or so. But um, there used to be that limit. Obviously, RGS Online does provide. Uh, other capabilities, it, it does have an API that you can use and do uh, geocode with uh, thousands and thousands of addresses. So when you're doing an uh, interactive uh, geocoding like I'm doing, you may run into some uh, constraints, but those go away if you take really advantage of the uh, RGIS online API for geocoding. Thanks. Thanks, Milton. I'm going to do one other quick question. Um, I, there are a bunch of questions about NAPSIG as an organization and membership and things like that. I'll get to later on, folks, so um, hang tight. Um, but a te another technical question. When AGOL geocodes, is there a way to retain the non-address information like the emergency or non-emergency phone numbers in the final data set? That, yes, the answer is yes. Let me show you that right now. So if I click on any of these points, Notice how the phone number came along. So you don't lose any of that known geographical information. So this is the district office. Uh, this is uh, the one on 71 Southwest 71st Avenue. And if I go back to Broward County, you will find the same address here. So uh, that's this one right here. So it does carry over the additional information. So that's a, that's a very good question because if there are other things that you want to have access to from RGIS Online, you want to add those additional attributes in your table. So that's a very good question. So the answer is yes. Great. All okay, right, should I Okay, sounds good. So uh, now we have a nice map. Uh, the only problem with it is that I cannot visually, by just looking at them, I cannot tell which ones are fire stations and which ones are uh, a sheriff office um, district locations. So uh, one of the things that I can do, I can go to the table of contents, and in this case, I'm going to click on the drop down arrow for the fire rescue stations layer. And I'm going, notice that there is a lot of options here, and we'll use some of this in the webinar next month. But for the purposes of today's webinar, what I like to do is select change symbols. So I click on that, 
and it says, okay, it's a single symbol, what would you like to do with that? I can change the color, I can change the size, uh, and so on, right? And that would be uh, more of a manual process, but notice that, that I have an options here, so I'm going to click on options and select change symbol. And this is very nice because uh, Esri has done a very good job of providing lots of different options to symbolize your data. So you create a much more pleasing cartographic product that is easier not only for you, but those who consume the map to understand. Um, if I click on the drop down arrow, notice that there are many different options. For example, if we were dealing with a disaster, so instead of this being fire stations, assume they are disaster locations. So Esri has added a, a pretty good uh, set of options to symbolize a type of disaster, whatever that disaster may be. Uh, they also have one that is perfect for the community listening to this webinar, and it's called safety and health. And if I select safety and health, notice that there's a lot of options. And for those of you in public safety, uh, I believe you will recognize some symbols here that you can use right away. Um, uh, for the purpose of this webinar, I'm going to say that the fire stations can use this symbol, it's a fire truck, it has a nice widget to increase or minimize the size. I like to just type it in, that's 30, and I click done, and now I can easily identify which of all those points, those geocoded points on my map are actual fire stations. So what I like to do is say that I'm done with the changes, and I'm going now to do exactly the same thing with the other layer. So the other layers are the county sheriff uh, office district locations. I go to change symbols, go to options, select the change symbol option. He knows that the last selection I had was under safety and health symbology. I'm going to remain there. For this In this case, I'm going to select a police car. You can pick uh, another one. Uh, and I'm going to specify to be 30 as well. Click done, click done, change in symbols. And now I can see police cars that represent the county sheriff's office and fire truck symbols that indicate those are fire rescue stations. Um, one of the nice thing, one of the first things that you notice here is that you see a lot of fire stations in this location sort of a concentration of them. There's another concentration of fire stations here. And RGIS will give you a lot of different tools to perform analysis. That's beyond the scope of today's webinar, but you could do analysis and identify why is it that we have more stations in one location as opposed to another? Uh, are we underserving? Uh, are there is a need to uh, maybe move a fire station to another location or open a a fire uh, county sheriff office at another location based on um, uh, the growth of the community or increasing crime uh, or whatever that may be. Um, and we'll, we'll cover some of those in the webinar in about a month from now. So what have I done now? I geocoded two tables. Um, uh, I was able to modify the symbology so that can visually I can much more easily identify which ones are office, uh, sheriff office district locations and which ones are fire rescue stations. Now what I like to do before I go on is to save my work. I don't want to lose what I've done so far. So to save your work, you click on save as and it gives you this dialog box and I'm going to give it a name uh, that makes sense to me and, and I want to do something that is very specific because maybe in the future I'll like somebody else to look at this map and just by looking at the name, at the title of the map, they know what it is. So I'm going to call it Broward County Sheriff and Fire Rescue Stations. Okay. Uh, the next thing that I need to do is add um, Make sure that it's spelled correctly. The next thing I need to do and is required is to add a tag. So tags are, think of them as a keyword that I can use to search against a gallery of maps. So one would be fire, for example, hit enter. Another one may be 
sheriff. Another one may be police. And I'm sure you can come up with a number of tags that totally makes sense uh, to you. You can have a summary. And in this case, I will save it in my own folder under NAPSIC. I'm a member of NAPSIC. I, I have access to their RGIS online subscription, so it goes right into my folder, and I click Save, and now I have saved my map. Um, what exactly does it mean that I saved my map? Where do I see it? Well, I'm, I'm seeing it right here, but if I go to Home, My Content, and there is the map. So if for whatever reason you end up at a, a, some location and you need to find your way around, again, go to Home and select My Content, you find your map. Uh, let's assume that I liked, uh, I, this is a real nice map, it, it really served the business needs of my department, and I like to share the work that I have done. So one of the things that I can do is I'm going to add a checkbox to this particular layer. You may end up with a lot of maps eventually here. Uh, so I need to specify which one I'm going to work with. So I add check mark, I click share, and I have two options. Um, I can share with the public or I can share within my organization. So in this case, we are using the NAPSIC RGIS online subscription called NAPSIC Foundation. I'm going to click OK. And notice that when I click OK, under, under share, it's going to go from not share to share within my organization. So any of you who are, that are members of the NAPSEC organization on RGIS Online will be able to see this map. Um, well, what if I want to share with the public? Yes, so uh, you, just like you share with NAPSEC, you can also share with the public. Uh, there are different, different ways to do that. I, I, I can go back here and click share, but I want to show you a different way of doing it. Uh, which is I'm going to click on my map to see the item details about that map. So here's a specific page for that map. It gives me a little um, thumbnail of what the map looks like, uh, created by me today. I don't have any ratings yet, so I hope you'll give it some stars in the future. Notice how I can share this map through Facebook and Twitter. So many public safety organizations today have their own Twitter feed and their own Facebook account to communicate with the public. So you may want to share that through those social media venues. Um, notice here the tags, so people can identify or they can do a search by any of these tags that I created. Uh, I can, at this point, also, uh, um, actually, let's go ahead and open the map. So it brings me back where I was before. So again, it's a way for you to navigate in case you, you need to find your way around. Let's go to share. And you see what happened? So under share, I can see NAPSIC Foundation. If I want to share with the public, um, I may just go to and share with the entire public, which means it's available to anybody on RGIS online. Also notice what happened here. It gave me a link to this specific map. So I'm going to copy this link just for kicks, and I'm going to go to a different browser altogether and paste that link there, and there's the map. So you're sharing this map with the public. It looks just like the other map, except that it doesn't give you the capability to modify the symbology or to do any of the analysis. Uh, again, it's because you're just sharing the map. If you want to modify the symbology, the look and feel of the map, do a spatial analysis using RGIS Online, it does require that you have an RGIS Online subscription. So let me go back to my previous a window, I'm sharing the map with the public. You click on every one. Again, you can share through Facebook or Twitter. But notice a couple of the things that Esri has done here. Um, and again, we're not going to go through that today, but you could considerably take this map and embed it in another website um, or turn this mapping into an entire full-blown web application. 
that you can make available to the public. Uh, under the embed in website is pretty neat and we're not gonna do it today, but it'd be the sort of thing that will allow you to take this map the way it is right now and I could go to the Broward Sheriff's Office and embed that map somewhere right here within the map. Obviously, I need to be working with the with the uh, web manager for the county. They're not going to just let me do it, right? But it'd be the sort of thing that you may want to take into account for your own communities and your own organizations. All right. So what have we done up to this point? We did geocoding. We have a CSV file that properly formatted to improve the quality of the geocoding. I modify symbology, I save my map, and then I share my map either within my organization, NAPSEC, or with the public. Uh, I could be a member of many groups, so when I do a, a share, I can, I can have numerous groups listed under here. Notice that when I select every one, that includes even the NAPSIC Foundation. So you could eventually be a member of the NAPSIC Foundation and the Broward County organization and, and so on and so on. All right. Uh, one of the things that uh, that is important to do is be more aware of uh, situational awareness. That's critical in a public uh, safety uh, setting. So what I'd like to do next is go ahead and play a little bit about with some additional data content that is critical for situational awareness. So I'm going to just find a specific address here. I got 10550 Sterling. So I already searched for this address before, so it does come up automatically. I'm going to select this one in Copper City. So it's a location in Broward County. This, is, this, is, this one is interesting because it does have both a fire rescue and a police station at the same location. In terms of uh, situational awareness, it looks like there are some water features. Those may be rotation uh, ponds. Looks like there's a sport complex and so on. Um, one of the things, Maybe my boss has asked me to do many more analysis around this location. So one of the things I may want to do since I'm going to be working at this particular location for a couple of weeks is maybe create a bookmark to that location. So I go to bookmarks, add bookmark, and I'm going to call it Copper City. And hit enter, and now I have a bookmark. So if for whatever reason, let's say I go back to the map extend on the entire area, and I need to go back to Copper City. I don't need to type that address. I can just go to bookmark, select Copper City, and it brings me to that location. So those are different techniques that you can use to navigate faster around our GIS online. So uh, creating bookmarks is a really good, it's a, it's a good tip, and you can have as many bookmarks as you like. Uh, to continue working on situational awareness, I'm going to add I'm thinking that it would be nice to have some satellite imagery. So I go to the Add button here and browse for S3 map layers. Notice that you can add layers from the web and maybe there are other organizations that have shared their content. You can link to them. You can add layer from a file, like a shape file or something like that. But in this case, I'm going to browse for S3 map layers. It brings me to the dialog box and under categories, notice there's a lot of categories here to you for you to look for. I'm going to select base map imagery. And S3 has agreements with um, uh, satellite image of providers that make their data available on RGIS online. In this case, I'm going to pick this one. If you put your cursors above it, it gives you a little bit of information about it. In this case, I'm going to add it as a layer. And now I got the satellite imagery. So in terms of situational awareness, now on top of the here map content, the vector street data, now I have satellite imagery to go along with it. Uh, this could be for, uh, in case of a, a fire or some uh, incident, and you want to get a sense of what's around that particular location. All right, so uh, for the purpose of what we're doing today, we have uh, geocoded a single address and done a geosearch. We did batch geocoding. We learned a little bit about how to construct your .csv, .csv sorry, uh, files. 
Uh, make sure you got the right fields and the right information so you can geocode all your addresses that uh, may represent, in this case, fire rescue stations, so they may represent incident data um, uh, or, or whatever that may be that you are trying to geocode for your public safety uh, business purposes. We learn how to modify symbology. We learn how to add imagery to improve the situational awareness um, understanding, get a better feel of what's going on around me or around a location of interest. And we also learn how to save your content and finally, we also learn how to uh, go back to the full extent by selecting a layer and say zoom to. And we also learn how to share the data, my map, either within my organization or with the entire public. We also learn that if, if you need to get back to, for whatever reason, you need to go back to where your content is, you just go to home, my content, and that sort of helps you sort of navigate around RGIS online. Okay. So that is uh, the full um, session for the day. And the actual um, tutorial towards the end, there is some challenge steps that you can use, for example, to add photos to locations so that when you click on one of these locations, you can also uh, get a little bit, a link to a website, a website for that particular fire station and a photo of that fire, uh, fire station as well. So that's part of a challenge step under the tutorial. Um, Peter? Thanks very much, Milton. Um, <clears throat> this has been great. We're having a, a tremendous amount of uh, interest and questions from folks. Um, so I'm going to try to go through a few before we get to a, a couple other um, comments that I had. Uh, one question is, can shapefiles be created from the imports from Excel? And I think, can you take the data you import from Excel yes. and make a shapefile out of it? Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah, uh, you can actually take these locations and save them as shapefile so that you can use them in RGIS desktop. And, and what right. we can do is I can give you, uh, uh, we, we can send details on how to do that afterwards, yeah. Okay, and, and in the, we, we just had another question that was pretty much similar. Um, then another question, when constructing an address, um, is are the rules as to how the address is entered, this is always a fun one, right, like symbology, mm -hmm. um, such as avenues and streets, um, are, what are the rules? So can an ST, can you use ST or do you have to spell out street? Yeah, that's a very good question. Of course, all questions are good. Uh, but uh, so, because geocoding, of course, I made it look very easy here, uh, but the actual the process that I went through to build this file is very interesting. I actually went to, I don't have a relationship with Broward, Broward uh, County Sheriff's Office, so what I did, I actually went to this website and I found each one of those addresses and I had to manually type them in into Excel. Um, notice that uh, I think for the most Far, I was consistent on writing a street, spelling it out. This one for Boulevard ID, BBLVD, and so on. So here's the beauty of working with uh, a, a, a good street data set. So one of the things that we provide to ESRI as part of the Here Map content is that we provide alternative names for addresses. You may find, you may hear, uh, it's, it's very popular in, in, in you know, uh, fancy places like New York City where you have an address, but it's, also, it's actually known by something else. So uh, when ESRI builds their uh, geocoding locators, ESRI takes into account alternative addresses names, right? Instead of a physical address, it may be known as something else. Uh, also, uh, uh, when you build the geocoding locators, ESRI uh, is, a, uh, the geocoding locators are smart enough to identify that SD is also the name as, it's the same as street, AV is the same as avenue, and so on. Uh, however, I strongly recommend that within your organizations, you, 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 you be consistent on how you build those. So if everybody's just spelling it out, try to make sure that everybody in your organization is just spelling that out. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the locators and the street data are very good at being able to um, uh, uh, identify those and, and get to the right location. Uh, that's not to say that 
there are many companies out there whose only focus is to clean up addresses uh, because there is such inconsistency, particularly when you're getting data from many sources, that uh, a lot of there are a lot of companies there that are, uh, their business is data cleansing. So um, I made it look easy, but it can be very complicated. Uh, there are standards, and you can probably look at um, uh, many government agencies have come up with states. If you most states in the United States uh, are part of NISJIC, and NISJIC has come up with standards for a lot of these things. So look at your statewide GIS program. Look at your own agency if they have uh, a standards. Try to follow those. Uh, and obviously, if you're dealing with millions and millions of addresses, there are companies out there that do data cleansing to facilitate geocoding. Yeah, that, that's great. And I, I would just highlight the, um, you know, the, the more consistent you are within your agency, city, county, state, um, ahead of time, the less you're going to need to clean things up um, after the fact. And the easier it is then, obviously, to share data across agencies, which we're, we're highly in favor of. Uh, Milton just referenced uh, an organization called NISGIC. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, it's the National States Geographic Information Council, uh, nsgic.org, uh, a fantastic group of people who will help you in any way, shape, or form. Um, they're, they're a partner organization of ours, and we do a lot with them, and, and um, I just can't recommend uh, them more highly as a resource, um, uh, really good folks, and a lot of them have public safety backgrounds or strong experience in public safety, so they'll, they'll understand a lot of your needs. Um, I'm going to do a couple more questions, um, try to get as many as we can, but we do have a lot. Um, it, it, I'll try to do some of the quick ones. Is it possible to save the shape file to a local drive on my laptop? Uh, that should be an easy one. Uh, the answer is yes. You can save it anywhere on the network, uh, uh, share it to SharePoint, but yes, the answer is yes. Great. Uh, next is, can you manually place locations on the map for records that do not automatically batch geocode? Can I manually add locations to the map? Uh, that's a good question because right at the top of my head, I. Uh, I don't know how to do that in RGS online, but I do know how to do that in RGS desktop. So I'm going to err on the side of saying the answer is yes. I, I, it's something that you can definitely do on the desktop. Um, okay, and if that's something someone's having any sort of um, uh, trouble with, just get in touch with us, and uh, you know we can try to find you know put you hook you up or something. We can give you a tutorial on how to do that. Um, yeah. What if, uh, another question, this is a great one. What about entering real-time information from departments of transportation and other agencies? Um, for example, there is a little bit of a snowfall going on in the Northeast, and we still mm -hmm. have folks from the Northeast who dialed in, so thank you. Um, but uh, can, you, can you enter real-time information into this um, system? Uh, the, the, answer, the answer is yes. So uh, notice that one of the options here is add a layer from the web. So, and, and I'm certainly uh, off guard here, but one of the options here is add layer from the web. Options here is that I can add uh, an RGS server web service, an OGC web service, et cetera, et cetera. So this is interesting because if I, if I knew, and right at the top of my head, I'm sorry, I apologize, I don't know if there is an OGC web service for uh, a snowstorm or something to that effect, I could literally point that out and, and use it as a base map, for example, and click Add Layer. So the answer is yes. Uh, I just don't know right at the top of my head what that is. Uh, you can also, if I go to Base Map, um, I'm sorry, if I click Add from Map Layers, I can type Snow, and I'm just uh, guessing here whether or not there is any snow related, and you can maybe find, I don't see one specific to the snowstorm, but you can use the browse S3 map layers, for example, to bring that in. Um, so the answer is yes, you just need to know. Here's one, for example, this is traffic, real-time traffic data. So this is the here traffic that RGS online users, you can bring that in, that will be real-time traffic at this point. Uh, so the, the answer is yes, you do need to know how to connect to that service. Great. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, with addresses, do you need an alias file? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so the alias file is, uh, when I was saying an, an alternative address name, that's exactly what I'm referring to. Yeah, so it's also called an alias file. Yeah, great. So um, if you okay, have it, that's uh, just go, if, if you have it, that's just going to help you improve your geocoding. Perfect. Um, anything else more you want on the map before I um, highlight a couple other things for the folks in the audience? No, I'm uh, I'm good. Thank you very much. If there are questions, please send them over to us, and we'll we'll get them answered and send out to to everyone. Okay, great. I'm going to uh, transfer over the controls to me. Um, hopefully, we can make this pretty smooth. Um, don't tell me when you see my desktop. You see my desktop? I think it's coming up. Okay. Great, you good? Uh, I see it now, yeah. Okay, great. So um, some folks, a lot of folks have been asking about NAPSIG um, and some of the uh, resources that Milton has been referencing. Um, I'll show you a couple of them right now. Um, this is our main website. Um, and if you go to the events button here, just open the screen, you'll see next month's um, session on um, techniques for efficient public safety routing. There's still available space, although it is filling up exceptionally quickly. Um, uh, but if you want to register for that, that's how you access that. Um, other folks have asked how you access the training tutorials that Milton referenced. Um, one way to do that, and the best way, is to go to our Capabilities and Readiness Assessment tool, our Carrot. Um, when that opens up, you will see this tool. You can explore this tool, um, and it's a really wonderful resource on showing you best examples, specific examples that are, that are static as well as dynamic AGOL examples, uh, different maps and, and, and activities that are going on within AGOL for everything from you know, urban search and rescue to um, recovery activities to preparedness to planning. Um, but importantly, for this particular purpose, um, if you go about halfway down, you'll see training tutorials. All you have to do is click on that, and the tutorials that Milton references will pop up. Um, I promise it will, just my computer decided to be slow. Um, but these training tutorials will have um, all of the information that Milton referenced um, today. Um, and I'll go back to those in a second. For some reason, my computer just decided to slow down. Um, other folks asked about NISGIC, the National States Geographic Information Council. If you look at this organization here, You'll see uh, nsgic.org. Um, we do encourage you to talk to them. They're really a great organization. Um, and if you have any trouble reaching any of your individual state GIOs, just let me know and, and we can put you in touch with them. Um, here are the training tutorials. And so you, we give you some um, information about the future training tutorials, um, but there are sample data sets and two training tutorials that are existing right now for um, geocoding and for routing for next month. Um, so please do take a look at those, and, and we, we would like to give our strongest thanks to here and to Milton for um, putting a lot of work into making this happen. Um, and then the final thing is some folks have asked about the NAPSIG ArcGIS Online um, and, and what Milton has done here. Now, you don't have to be within our actual uh, National Alliance for Public Safety GIS um, uh, ArcGIS online subscription, and we only have a, you know, a limited number of seats that Esri um, is very graciously given to us. Um, so I would suggest a couple things. One is we will create a specific group that will be public. Um, you can see the groups here. Um, if you have an existing AGOL account, um, we will allow anyone who wants to have access to look at some of the maps and applications that Milton has built, and we'll post them onto that group. Um, if your agency wants to go a little bit deeper and has an idea for how to really integrate this sort of uh, geocoding and then perhaps the routing um, into your agency and you need some help and you want to do it within NAPSIG's AGOL because you don't have a subscription, um, we can give you a temporary subscription and some help in, that, in um, implementing that. Um, and that would be at no cost, although it can only be a temporary subscription because we try to help as many agencies as we can, and there are only a certain number of, of uh, AGOL seats that we're able to secure. So um, that's something you're welcome to reach out to us and, and talk to us about. If you have an existing AGOL account and you need assistance, we're, we're here for you as well. Um, so just reach out to us. Um, 
And finally, the best way to send, um, uh, reach out to us for any questions or any assistance, like I mentioned with an AGOL, um, please contact, whoop, my screen just went blank. Um, please contact, well, you can contact me because some reason my, um, my uh, PDF, my PowerPoint screen just went blank. Um, you can contact me or Rebecca Harned um, at any time with the NAPSIG, and I'll show you how to reach us. That would be right, maybe a good way to do it. Um, we do have a bunch more questions. I think what, given the time frame, we want to try to stay on time. Um, the best thing to do is to um, just try to wrap up for right now, and we will, um, uh, you know, reach out to folks who have specific questions. And if you want to um, contact us for any other um, support or any of the questions, feel free to do so. Um, here is Rebecca Harned's information, and here is my information. We're the two easiest people to reach out to. Um, and if you want to talk to Milton, I'm sure he will do his best to make himself available. Um, that being said, Milton, anything else you would like to add? Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say here is obviously a supporter of, of, of NAPSIC and we're a member of NISTIC as well. So we're very engaged with uh, a lot of those organizations that are there to help you. And we look forward to having you in our webinar next month. Yep, great. Thank and you. so again, just w one more big thanks to the folks that here for all the time and effort they put into making this available. It's really terrific. Um, and, um, you know, if you do have any questions, please never be um, hesitant to reach out to us. We're here to help you. And, and most important, we just want to thank all of you, um, especially the folks in the Northeast, but all of you who participated in this. Um, the, the response to this particular um, training session has been just fantastic. Um, and we know you all are very busy and we're grateful for the time that you take um, and the interest you take in the resources we put out. If there are other ideas that you have that we can address, um, please don't ever hesitate to ask. Um, we will do our best to cover that topic. Um, and any other resources or, or, or um, you know, training or anything like that that NAPSI can do, that's why we're here. Um, so please reach out to us. Um, the recording is now stopped.